This week on the Back Table Podcast. This may sound bad, but I think the biggest tip that I have is to not be perfect. And I say that in all seriousness because uh, there's a lot of nerve structures of the neck. And so you want to avoid the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the middle cervical sympathetic ganglion. You want to avoid the vagus. Uh, and it's benign disease in most cases. Every now and then you'll get a micropapillary thyroid carcinoma that you'll do, which is different. But I would say 95% of cases, you're talking about benign thyroid nodules, right? And they're symptomatic. And so when I think about the HCC or think about RCC, like uh, liver cancer or kidney cancer, you know, you really want a margin, right? You either want a one centimeter or five millimeter margin, depending on the disease you're treating. This is a benign nodule. You know, don't perseverate and trying to be perfect and covering the entire nodule because you'll run into trouble. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Back Table Podcast. If you're a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, which is backtable.com. Very easy to remember. Subscribe to the show, leave us a review, or reach out to us on social media. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. This discussion is supported by Siemens Health and Years. What's one of the primary reasons outpatient care sites fail? Inadequate front-end planning. If you're planning to provide outpatient care, you need a clear, cohesive strategy. A strategy that supports your unique vision for success. Siemens Health and Years is here to empower you in every care setting, every step of the way. Visit Siemens-HealthandYears.us to discover the seven key elements of a comprehensive outpatient site strategy and learn how providers leverage the specific expertise, products, and services from Siemens Health and Years to meet their outpatient care goals. Embracing innovation, enhancing outcomes. Greetings to our esteemed IR community. Today's podcast is proudly sponsored by Varian, a Siemens Health and Ears company. Picture a future where cutting edge interventional technologies are seamlessly integrated with world-class imaging tools that are designed to reshape procedural efficiency, enhance precision, and foster patient-centered care and interventional radiology. Because that's our vision at Varian, and we're working with partners across Siemens Health and Ears to bring it to life. At Varian, we are in hot pursuit of efficiency and superior outcomes. Our evolving portfolio is reshaping ablation and embolization procedures with tools that offer intuitive, unique capabilities. Imagine a world without fear of cancer, where Varian solutions empower you to deliver individualized, high-quality treatments. Solutions like Embazine and Oncazine, our line of precisely calibrated microspheres designed to enable super-selective, targeted embolization. What sets our Embazine and Oncazine microspheres apart? Features that enhance procedural and cost efficiency, like precise calibration and syringes that contain more microspheres per volume, which means fewer syringes per procedure, an innovation that aligns seamlessly with Varian's commitment to efficiency. And Embazine microspheres offer a broad spectrum of 10 sizes, each identified by distinctive colors, facilitating swift and precise visualization of suspension. This streamlines the process and also minimizes the potential for errors. So experience the future of interventional radiology with Varian. Check out our innovative solutions at varian.com slash interventional. Varian, a Siemens Health and Ears company, we pioneer breakthroughs in healthcare for everyone, everywhere, sustainably. Now, back to the show. Our topic today is thyroid interventions with a focus on thyroid ablation. To help us with this discussion, we have Dr. Gary Say from UCLA. Gary, welcome to the show. All right. Thanks for the welcome. Happy to be here and excited for the talk. Real quick, will you just tell us a little bit about the training, a little bit about where you are in your practice, and then I'll launch in and ask all the thyroid-related practice questions. But just like, you know, general, like, when did you get out? How long you been out? That kind of thing. Sure. Uh, you know, I did uh, residency at UC Davis and then fellowship at UCLA. That was probably around 2017. I, it's a couple of years ago now. It's hard to remember. So I did my vascular interventional radiology training at UCLA. And then afterwards, I actually went to private practice first, previously at Mission Hospital and then Long Beach Memorial for, I want to say, about three years. Following that, uh, there was an opportunity to come back to UCLA. So I, I did. And I have been here probably for the last three years. So I've been in practice about six years. So going from private practice to academics, how was that transition? Pretty smooth, no problems? No, it was smooth, actually. It was funny. At the time, I, I didn't think, you know, I could go either way, academics or private practice. Private practice was great. 
the the biggest thing I miss was interacting with residents and fellows, which I do get now. And so certainly that's been very rewarding. Uh, the biggest transition, to be honest, is I don't get to do diagnostics anymore. And th- that is something that I do miss. But but obviously, I, I do 100% IR. So uh, that's also very rewarding. You know, you hear plenty of people going to and from, like switching from academics to private practice and going back and forth. Like I'm, I'm in private practice and I, sometimes it's just like the idea of like going into academics now is like, oh, it seems... You can, it can feel a little daunting, um, <laughs> you know, going from like a private practice and then getting back into like the academic swing of things where, you know, UCLA must be tertiary, quaternary referral center, super high volume, super complex cases. Yeah, no, it definitely is. I definitely see a lot more complex cases at UCLA. The nice thing about private practice, I think, is that you get uh, a little bit more breath because you see a lot more stuff that you probably didn't see in training or in fellowship. And I got to learn from a lot of guys that did things differently. Perhaps if I ended up at a different academic center, I would have had the same experience, but it was nice uh, in private practice learning from these 67 year old guys that, you know, still do the double stick Neff tube technique. Sure. Uh, st- yeah. Stuff like that, that, you know, I- I've never seen yeah, before, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but I can do it. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Good for you that you, you have a process for that. I mean, like the double stick Neff tube or the double stick for like a biliary drain, I mean, it can really get you out of a jam. And sometimes it takes you a little while to like wrap your head around that, at least for me. For sure. No, I agree. I absolutely. All right. So now we're talking thyroid interventions. How did you end up in this area of IR? Yeah. So it's interesting. I think when I first started at UCLA, I was hired on to really build the interventional oncology program. We already have a pretty stalwart program at UCLA, do a lot of ablations, Y90s, taste, et cetera. But I realized, quickly realized that you know, there's a lot of people at UCLA that already does that. And it's kind of hard to carve a niche, if you will, at an academic program where other people have been there for many years as certain referral patterns. So I was fortunate enough to have a great mentor, Mike Duick, who's an abdominal radiologist. Him and David Liu sort of were pioneers, at least in the US, in bringing this thyroid intervention program to the States from Europe and Asia. Uh, And they sort of took me under their wing and, you know, they needed a third hand. So that's how I got joined in and, and, and started with them learning how to do thyroid ablations. But having the diagnostic aspect, being able to read the ultrasound, being able to obviously do simple biopsies and FNAs, the next step is the therapeutics. So from that perspective, that was sort of the niche I was starting to develop. All right. So let's jump into it. Start out with indications like thyroid ablations, benign, malignant etiologies, both. I know what the papers say. I'm just curious about like how your practice is kind of shaped up. I think that obviously there has to be a symptom. A lot of patients come in with both cosmetic issues as well as symptom issues. Uh, We're always asking about whether they have difficulty swallowing or coughing or difficulty breathing as they lay down. So every time we talk to a patient, there's a symptom and a cosmetic score uh, that we record in our H&P. And that's sort of what drives our decision making. Again, cosmetic score is something that we as is the physical exam, I can see it or I can't see it. Uh, and the symptom scores what the patient tells us. So those are the primary things. And again, like we said, difficulty swallowing, coughing, a pressure effect on the neck. Uh, those are all things that we look for. So these these are all like what you're talking about is all benign nodules, right? Correct. I mean, I would say that to just bring it back for one second, I think that, you know, IR, we, we've we played a dramatic role in like liver, for example, and kidney, right? We, we could read the MRI, we can do the biopsy, you can do the ablation or an embo. I feel that we've grown now in the endocrine world where we can read the ultrasound, we can do the biopsy, and we can offer ablation and even embolization, which, you know, we can touch up on during this talk, but, uh, you know, we can offer the full gamut of services. And so ablation obviously is the lowest hanging fruit in this regard because it offers patients great outcomes and, and minimal complications, if you will. Talk about referral patterns. So you can either take it from two ways. What are the common ways that you guys are getting patients? Or if like this was a service line you built, I think all the audience would really like to know, how did you establish those referral patterns? Do you know what I mean? Sure. No, absolutely. Uh, I think that it's 50-50 right now. We get a lot of self-referral as well as through our endocrine and endocrine surgery colleagues. Uh, when we first started doing this, probably I want to say 2014 or 2015, but again, the volume really didn't pick up till 2020. It was just us. And Korea and Italy has been doing it for a long time. So there's robust data as to the outcomes and the low complications. And so we in the US obviously had lagged with the FDA approval. But since we started doing it, 
a lot of our uh, endocrinology and endocrine surgeons would refer these cases to us for patients that really absolutely didn't want surgery because for the patients that had a symptomatic nodule, they really only had one option and it was hemithyroidectomy, which comes with its issues and complications and recovery and possible thyroid hormone replacement. So having a procedure where you can avoid all of that and it's an outpatient, no sedation, you know, they just take a Xanax procedure uh, with great outcomes was something that our colleagues, the surgeons and the endocrinologists were happy to send to us uh, and we're happy to take them on. So and then the other half was uh, self-referral. We did a few YouTube videos, which have pretty good hits from viewers. And so we, we certainly got a lot of just self-referrals that, that would come in and, and ask us to consult with them and then do the procedure. Again, most of these are benign nodules, but there are some sort of other indications like autonomously functioning nodules and cancers, but those are more rare. I like that you actually brought up hemithyroidectomy and potential need for thyroid replacement hormone. Because actually, I mean, this just shows you what I know about the thyroid is that I thought if you had a hemi, then, oh, you have a whole side of the thyroid. I just assumed that that was the side that would then like secrete all the hormones and you'd be fine. But, you know, having brushed up on this topic for this discussion, being on thyroid replacement hormone after a hemithyroidectomy, certainly something that's a possibility. Yeah. I mean, again, you're right. Uh, leaving half of the thyroid is obviously ideal so that you could potentially not have to have thyroid hormone replacement, but it's not unforeseen that that you do need to replace thyroid hormone. Uh, we have excellent endocrine surgeons at UCLA, but even within their consents for hemithyroidectomy, there is a phrase that says that there's a possibility of thyroid hormone replacement, which is essentially nil with thyroid ablation. I mean, we're really just killing the nodule, leaving all the normal thyroid tissue alone, which is you know to great effect for our patients. So you touched upon it already, having the the outline here for you to walk us through the procedure. But one of the first things I wanted to check off the box, anesthesia requirements, have them take a Xanax and then it's local after that. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the most amazing thing about this procedure and which is why it's fantastic for office-based labs or some outpatient sort of practice is our patients, they literally take, and it's up to them. I did two yesterday where the patients took nothing. Like there was just a local only procedure. But in general, I offer them one milligram of Xanax an hour before, uh, which they take at home. I prescribe it ahead of time. They take it at home. And then if they really still felt anxious, they can take another milligram 30 minutes before the procedure. But again, local is quite common, just lidocaine, bupivacaine, et cetera. So from a patient experience perspective, it's great. They show up, it's in and out. There's essentially no recovery. They leave with a, with an ice pack. So uh, I have never used anesthesia. I think when we first started doing this, we did do moderate sedation more because we were trying to get our bearings straight. But now that we're a well-oiled machine, we don't mess with any of that, obviously. The other thing that uh, is important about keeping it for local only or just a Xanax is, and we could probably touch upon this later, but the complications, which is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So you want the patient to be awake. You don't want them so asleep that they can't talk to you because you're going you're gonna to sense it immediately when there's a nerve injury. So you don't want them asleep, if anything. All right. So anesthesia, check, local, and maybe an anesthetic equipment that an interventionalist would need to perform the procedure? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is amazing. It's so simple for us. You know, we do ultrasound stuff all the time. We do it for vascular access. We do it for biopsies. It's so simple. All of us uh, interventionalists have an ultrasound machine. And it's up to you, dealer's choice, whether you want to use a linear or a baby head or a hockey stick, whatever, you know, dealer's choice. And literally, that's it. You have your 25 gauge needle that you're going to do a local anesthetic. And then you have your pro. Literally, that's it. So it's from a capital standpoint, it's very low hanging fruit. There's many vendors out there. Uh, we use a few, but uh, there's many different vendors for the RF machine. And the probes is really the only disposable that you're purchasing. So ultrasound and the RF generator and the probe is is essentially all that you really need to to get this done. And so this is all RFA, like no one's doing these with microwave, no one's doing these with cryo or anything? No, you know, at the most recent conferences, like one of the societies I'm part of is the NASA North American Society for Interventional Thyroidology. There are some companies now coming out with microwave technology that we've seen, but I think that the vast majority of us really just focus on RFA. Uh, and the, the main reasons for that, unlike liver and kidney is that you you really don't want to cause a ball of, of ablation, right? Because there's too many critical nerve structures in the neck. So you're really focusing on, not to get into the weeds of it, but there's two, there's the direct and the indirect heating. And uh, indirect is when you let that sort of sphere of ablation grow in the liver and the kidney. We're not doing that in the thyroid. 
we don't want that indirect thermal conduction to create an ablation zone. We're really using the frictional, which is the direct heat, the heat directly on the active tip. So that's why RFA is more desirable than microwave and cryo, for example, because you're not going to put the probe in and park it and let it grow. You're, you're, you're actively moving the probe. Okay. I kind of set up the straw man to actually hear. So will you kind of describe the technique of like how you ablate? You know, just like putting a probe in and parking it. I also want to hear a little bit about room setup. I mean, do you just kind of set up like a regular biopsy where like wherever you're comfortable, you stand there and it's uh Yeah. The room setup is pretty straightforward. You, obviously the patient stays in their gurney. There's two ways to do it. My colleague likes to do it like a dentist where he sits, you know, behind the head with his arms around the neck. I know exactly what you're talking about. And I just, I can't do that because it just, you know, freaks me out. You know, me breathing (laughs) on the patient, you know, my air going below the mask. It's just, it's just awkward. So, uh, (laughs) so you stand up to the side. I stand to the side. (laughs) You know, it gives me, you know, just a little bit more comfort there. But, um, sure. So we raise the bed. I stand up, but again, you can go head side. And I just come from one side. So if it's a left thyroid nodule, I'm standing on the patient's right. And then vice versa, if it's a right thyroid nodule, uh, we have the machine at head side, the ultrasound machine at head side. I usually have one ultrasound tech that helps me to, to run the machine to save pictures and to work the RF generator. And then, you know, that's it. Essentially prep the probe. Everything's local. Put my 20, 30 cc's of perithyroidal uh, lidocaine in, and then I can go ahead and get, get the probe in there. So is there anything to that uh, perithyroidal anesthetic in that when you say perithyroidal, like you just coat the entirety around the periphery of the the gland, of that side of the gland, like the right gland? Correct. So like if you were doing a, a right thyroid nodule ablation, I would just use your standard 25 gauge needle. You literally can separate the capsule of the thyroid. There's a little fascial plane between the strap muscles and the thyroid. And if you put the needle there and you put your 20, 30 cc's, you'll see the thyroid separate from the fascia. It, it'll literally just look like thyroid tissue coming apart from a, a tiny echogenic linear fascial plane. And it, it's great because it's almost like hydro dissection, if you will, but but it's just lidocaine. Once you do that, it's all numb. And you know you can do what you can to the nodule and the patient generally won't feel it. And when you actually get to the ablation, um, can you talk a little bit about the ablation technique in terms of you're not just putting the probe in and parking it, it's kind of a, a rolling ablation? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the the two techniques that have been described are, one, you want to do a trans-ismic approach. So you want to sort of go through normal thyroid tissue to get to where you need to get to. Uh, similar to when you biopsy a liver lesion, you kind of want to go through some normal liver tissue. So Uh, That gives you stability in the probe because, again, the patient's awake most of the time and they're talking, they're swallowing, they're breathing. So you can imagine that that nodule is moving and uh, your probe is moving as well. So you're doing a transismic approach. Again, that's primarily for left or right thyroid nodules. If it's an isthmic nodule, you're just going straight into it. But uh, you're going to go through the isthmus, which is normal thyroid tissues, to get to the nodule. And then you're doing this uh, well-described moving shot technique. And essentially what that means is you're putting the probe down you're going to turn the RF generator on so it's turned to burn tissue and you're going to slowly pull that probe back as it burns the tissue and you're seeing that all in ultrasound. You're going to see an ablation zone start to develop around that probe and the minute you see that, you slowly pull the probe back. There are also some people on the machine, there's impedance numbers that get read out. Uh, in general, if the impedance hits about 100, that's when I start to pull it back as well. So it's up to the operator how they want to do it. So you're going to do that moving shot technique. So again, the probe is moving the whole time. It's not parked and, and we're not letting that ablation zone grow. We're just letting, again, that direct frictional heat burn right around the tip of that probe. And you're going to slowly drag it back. And the minute you get to the medial edge of the nodule, if you will, you're going to turn the machine off, re-advance and do another uh, layer of that nodule. So you're going from deep to superficial when it comes to the nodule. Because a- as the ablation zone grows, Uh, you're going to lose visibility of the needle. So you always want to start deep and then move superficial. So whenever you're doing the nodule, deep to superficial and also medial to lateral until you cover the whole thing? We do do deep to superficial, but if anything, we're dragging from lateral to medial. Oh, lateral to medial. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, so I'm going to park the probe lateral and then drag it back medial, turn the machine off. Then I'm going to park the probe lateral again and drag it medial. And you do sort of each slice going from deep to superficial like that. If you had to paint a word picture, what does that ablation zone look like under ultrasound? Like whenever you see the needle heat up and the thyroid nodule kind of change echo texture? Uh, essentially, you're going to see very echogenic line that uh, it's like a cloud 
that only develops at the tip of the probe. And uh, when you drag it back, you'll see the needle. And then again, the little cloud will, will form that echogenic cloud with shadowing, obviously. And so that's what you'll see. And I, I generally tell people that I train, uh, you have to think about the nodule like a, like a loaf of bread, right? You, you're going to slice it, you know, from top to bottom or bottom to top, however you want. So you, you have to think about it in 3D and you, and you treat each slice, if you will, like that. Got it. So... That was my next question is that not only do you have to work from lateral to medial, but you have to work from top to bottom or bottom to top, however you see that you do it. Do you treat the entire nodule? Like, do you need to have 100% of the nodule treated or it just depends on the nodule, what's around it and what symptoms you're trying to alleviate? So the data shows that what we consider a large nodule, if you will, is something that's 25 cc's. Anything bigger than 25 cc's is very large. Uh, again, you know, doing your standard X times Y times Z times 0.25 volume calculation, if you will. 25 cc's is a decent sized nodule. If we're going above that, you might have to stage the ablation uh, where you do the bottom half and then you come back and do the top half. I think that now that we've had a lot of practice at UCLA, those patients, I would just take to thyroid embolization, which is a whole different thing. But I would say that if you have a 25 cc nodule, you should be able to do it in one setting. You should be able to get it done in under an hour. So you do try to treat the whole nodule. And what you're trying to target, again, uh, there hasn't been a lot of research on this specifically, like what's your goal, if you will. I think the vast majority of us go on ultrasound images. And when I see that echogenic cloud fill the whole nodule, then I'm done. There are some people that says, well, you should wait till you hit impedance of over 100 at each station. That could be particularly time consuming. I guess what I'm trying to say is if I see the echogenic cloud and the impedance isn't 100 yet, I'm still moving the probe back. And the ideal post ablation image of the nodule is it's completely echogenic uh, with the shadowing ablation zone. Also, it's completely devascularized. So beforehand, you're going to do an ultrasound where you can show the blood vessels supplying the nodule. Afterwards, it should be completely devoid of any arteries or veins or any vessels. It'll just literally look like it's it's dead. So that would be the goal for the better outcome of the nodule. Whenever you take your post, though, uh, I'm just imagining, you know, how some of my liver ablations look under ultrasound. Sometimes like they're all gassed out. I guess that's not how it looks for the thyroid interventions. But, you know, sometimes like you can't even see your liver lesion under ultrasound because there's so much artifact. But that's not exactly the case. That's not exactly what you see post on a thyroid. No, no, I know what you're talking about when you do a like a, a microwave ablation of a liver yeah, lesion. Yeah, like microwave, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, all... it just looks like a, I get it, it's like a like an iceberg, right? You just see the top and then yeah, you can't yeah, see yeah, exactly. it, yeah, yeah, anything yeah, yeah. beyond it. Uh, no, with the thyroid ablation, you will still be able to see the nodule. You won't be able to see the substance of the nodule because there's, you know, echogenic shadowing within it, but you are still able to actually see the deep margin to it. So I can see, you know, the normal thyroid tissue on the back. Okay. And so putting a color flow on, it's still reliable is what I was getting at. Still relatively reliable. Obviously you're going to have a little bit of twinkle artifact, but otherwise it's okay. So if you had to like go back in time and you're giving yourself advice, what are some of the things that you learned about doing this procedure, either with room setup or just efficiencies that you know now that you wished you had known that? For someone getting started, can you give them some procedural tips about this is going to make your life a little bit easier if you think to take on these cases. Um, I mean, this may sound bad, but I think the biggest tip that I have is to not be perfect. And I say that in all seriousness, because uh, there's a lot of nerve structures of the neck. And so you want to avoid the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the middle cervical sympathetic ganglion. You want to avoid the vagus. Uh, and it's benign disease in most cases. Every now and then you'll get a micropapillary thyroid carcinoma that you'll do, which is different. But I would say 95% of cases, you're talking about benign thyroid nodules, right? And they're symptomatic. And so when I think about the HCC or think about RCC, like uh, liver cancer or kidney cancer, you know, you really want a margin, right? You either want a one centimeter or a five millimeter margin, depending on the disease you're treating. This is a benign nodule. You know, don't perseverate on trying to be perfect and covering the entire nodule because you'll run into trouble. If you try to get that medial margin next to the tracheoesophageal groove too much, you're going to get a recurrent laryngeal nerve injury. And for benign disease, you really want to have the best outcome with a minimal complication. I mean, we want that for all disease, obviously, but particularly benign disease, you don't want someone leaving with vocal cord injury or vocal cord paralysis. So that's probably the first thing and the foremost thing that I would recommend is, look, try to get 
98% of the nodule. If you miss a small area that's critical, it's low, you can't see it, there may be a little bit of substernal extension, just don't worry about it because it's better to get in and get out and not cause any harm, particularly again for benign disease. And then the other thing I think from a time perspective is uh, there's various Again, manufacturers out there, different probe sizes, it's dealer's choice. But once you're past the medial margin, which is the tracheal esophageal groove, you can go to town. You can crank up the wattage and it'll speed up the ablation to the rest of the nacho because you're away from all the critical structures. And uh, you can really uh, get away with burning pretty quickly and not waiting for the lower wattage. Yeah. yeah, not being so precious, like whenever you know you're in a safe zone. Exactly. Absolutely. So those are probably the two biggest takeaways. Otherwise, this is a very, very straightforward procedure for most interventionalists out there. I can believe this. So this is a nice uh, segue. So complications. Can you talk a little bit about common complications, things like you guys have actually seen in the practice, and then we'll talk about maybe the complications that are less common, but the ones that you really want to avoid? So I think that the, the main thing that we all talk about, uh, obviously, there's going to be the, the simple things that we see, some bruising, some hematoma, you know, those things happen, whatever organ you're dealing with. And we do see that every now and then. And those are very self-limited. You know, you put an ice pack on and it's not a big deal. The nerve injury is obviously the one that is a major complication we really want to avoid. And we do every now and then see it. Uh, I think in the literature, it says that you can have recurrent laryngeal nerve injury in about 0.17% of cases. And I think that's probably on par. You know, I've probably seen one or two. Most of them are self-limited, but they happen immediately. Like the patient's talking to you and they get hoarse. And immediately I turn the probe off and we do something called a D5 rescue. So if you're doing these cases, you need to have really cold D5 on hand. And there's some great articles in PubMed, but what you do is you just park a 22 gauge spinal right where you think that nerve resides. Again, tracheal drill groove. And you put in your 10 to 20 cc's of really cold D5 and their voice returns relatively immediately. Uh, and again, it's because you're causing thermal injury of that recurrent laryngeal nerve in where it resides. And so they're going to have ipsilateral vocal cord paralysis or vocal cord weakness. So by cooling it off immediately, you can protect that nerve. But even if they have some mild residual recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, most of the data shows that it's self-limited. So it will resolve over weeks to possibly months. So the recurrent laryngeal nerve is the one that you want to really avoid. The vagus nerve and the middle cervical sympathetic ganglion live generally in the carotid sheath or around the carotid sheath. And as you can imagine, you'll have Horner syndrome, ptosis, meiosis, antihydrosis, ipsilateral for the cervical sympathetic ganglion. And then if you injure the vagus nerve, you know, C345, if you will. So GI issues, nausea, vomiting. Uh, but again, those are relatively rare. I'd say that the recurrent laryngeal nerve is the one that you really want to stay away from, but you do see every now and then, and there are rescue techniques to avoid that. For another complication that's, you know, we don't see, I think at UCLA, we've maybe seen one is something called a nodule rupture. And you really want to avoid that theoretically because the nodule, there's a big hematoma that forms. It, it protrudes through the thyroid capsule. And so you could imagine now you have thyroid tissue protruding out of the thyroid capsule into the strap muscles, and you see this big mass-like effect over the skin. And in very rare cases, that can fistulize to the skin. And so you can have sort of a, a chronic wound, if you will. It literally looks like an abscess under the skin that's opened up. And all the data to date suggests to not drain it. Don't put them in antibiotics. Just conserve the management. There has been people that have done uh, sternocleidomastoid flaps, among many things, but these are self-limited. It may take months, but they do resolve. Um, but again, that is a major complication you don't want to see, I don't want to see, but again, happens very, very, very infrequently. Is there any way to avoid it? Or this is just like the cost of doing business in the thyroid ablation space? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that there are a few theories as to how to avoid it. Uh, again, the trans approach is best because you don't want to directly puncture the capsule over the nodule. You want to go through normal thyroid tissue. And again, to not be overly aggressive. Uh, and also don't ablate too close to the capsule because if you ablate too close to the capsule and you essentially burn a hole in the capsule, you're creating uh, a rent for where you know a hematoma or thyroid tissue can sort of protrude out. Is there anything to be concerned about with regards to 
I didn't read this in the paper, and so I'm kind of talking off the cuff, but like any kind of hormonal issues like thyroid storm or like if you start messing with a thyroid that you have like a, a hormone release or even vice versa, that's going to make someone hypothyroid either transiently or permanently, anything like that to worry about or is that a thing? Yeah, I think that most of the data shows that there may be a few subclinical hyperthyroid instances very rare. I, I think there's probably one case report where someone was hypothyroid afterwards, but that those are case reportable, right? That's it's not the common thing. So we don't routinely put our patients on um, methimazole or PTU or propanolol before procedures. I will say though that if you're treating autonomously functioning thyroid nodules, again the the three main buckets, if you will, are the benign thyroid nodules that are symptomatic, the autonomously functioning thyroid nodules, you know, those that are making thyroid hormone and then micropapillary thyroid carcinoma. So those are the three main buckets. And so if you are treating AFTN, the autonomously functioning nodules, uh, we generally have our endocrine colleagues on board because uh, before you want to ablate that, you want to have them optimize the thyroid inhibition with beta blockers, uh, methimazole, PTU, so that when you do the ablation and you will cause excessive thyroid hormone release, that we are protecting our patients uh, before that procedure. And then there's a protocol uh, that we do at UCLA where we slowly taper those meds off. And it's great. You know, we get our patients off of their thyroid inhibition in the long term. Any role for either routine or occasional hydrodissection? Yeah. If it's an ismic nodule, so, you know, one that's relatively midline in a thin patient, I will hydrodissect. We fortunately haven't seen any major skin burns in our practice, but there are some, you know, skin burns that have been reported. So I will routinely hydrodissect. Again, we, we use D5W because if you use normal saline, RF will conduct uh, the ions. So I will routinely use cold D5 and just hydrodissect the skin away from an ismic nodule. Otherwise, I generally don't do it preemptively. Uh, like I don't preemptively hydrodissect the recurrent laryngeal nerve or the carotid sheath, nothing like that in general. Okay. Do you or any of your partners use any continuous uh, neuromonitoring, maybe overkill? Yeah, no, we don't. Because they're awake, right? Yeah, they're awake, and which is why I think it's such a great procedure is I'm continuously monitoring our patients. And I, I'm talking to them the whole time. How are you feeling, you know, et cetera. And uh, if they feel any sort of pain, uh, again, this should be a painless procedure. The minute they feel pain, I stop, turn the probe off. And it's very easy if you move your ultrasound probe to just where the cricoid cartilage is and you just sort of scan north and you have them hum or you have them say words. You can visualize the vocal cords abducting symmetrically, right? So, oh, really, okay, right. So, I I do that the minute they, they feel anything. I don't care if it's pain in the ear that's uh, referred. I just stop and I check, and if everything looks fine, then I can continue my my ablation. But no, I don't routinely do neuro. So, good procedure, safe procedure. Patient goes home. Follow up. What does that look like for you guys in the IR clinic or either concurrently with endocrine or endocrine surgery? Oh, yeah. So we do a uh, follow-up uh, in general at 1, 3, 6, and 12 months. These days, I kind of follow up less frequently. I think earlier on, we did more frequent follow-up. So now I'm probably doing 1, 6, and 12 months. We generally follow up with clinic and an ultrasound and a TSH. That, I think, is more for data collection for us. We haven't seen any changes in thyroid functions. So, But we generally do a TSH and, again, 1, 6, and 12-month ultrasounds just to show that it's shrinking. Uh, and if you do see early regrowth, which sometimes you see at the two-year mark, then you're ready to go and you can bring them back and reablate. We don't want to reablate, but the, the nice thing is it's very possible and doable, and the patients don't really have any issues with that. So th that's the reason why we do the follow-up that we do. And as far as follow-up, uh, you mentioned reablation, but I don't know if you've talked to endocrine surgery or if any of your patients have then gone on to need surgery for whatever. Maybe they don't get the cosmetic result that they want or something, but have you closed any doors as far as endocrine surgery after an ablation? And you've already mentioned that re-ablation is on the table if needed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So so no, I don't think so. We have briefly discussed it with our endocrine surgery colleagues, which actually, interestingly enough, they have seen that our practice has grown so much, they've actually bought their own RF generator. <laughs> Get out of here. I'm, I'm, Get out of here. I'm serious. I'm serious. So we got to play nice in the sandbox. And they're great guys and girls, and, and they, they refer us cases, but they have bought their own RF machine. One of my colleagues has said that it does sometimes make the tissue planes during his dissection more challenging, if you will. Uh, but again, I, I can't tell you the last time I've had a patient need to go to hemithyroidectomy after an ablation. Usually 
I'd say 99.9% of the time, they're extremely happy with the results. And I've probably had maybe one that I had to reablate. I'd say that the vast majority do very well, especially if you stay under the 25 cc volume mark. You know, obviously, if it's much bigger, then you're going to expect to maybe have a few treatments. Nodules that are causing some mass problems or uh, mass effect issues. Is anything fair game that you can see or once a nodule gets to be like retrosternal or then you you're going up on like the risk of complications if you try and attack something like this? Yeah, no. So so if it starts to become retrosternal or subclavicular, it makes it very, very hard because you can't really do the moving shot technique because you're not going to have pro visualization. You're not going to have those techniques available. Um, I briefly alluded to it. In those particular cases where I have a symptomatic nodule that's retrosternal or subclavicular, I would just take them to thyroid embolization. Uh, it's very safe. We, again, don't have that many cases yet. It's pretty new. Um, but those are the cases I would take to thyroid embo. So again, as a IR, you have the full toolbox of things that you can do for these, these symptomatic nodules, but whether it be uh, small or large or whether it be you know superficial or within in the chest. So I, I would say that ablation probably plays zero roles in a retrosternal or subclavicular loop. All right, Gary, I'm not going to take up like all your time today because you're already very generous to give us your time on the weekend, but can you give us just like a couple minute rundown, thyroid embolization? What's cool about it? How long does it take? Is it a tough procedure? Whatever you want to talk about for just a couple of minutes, just a teaser. Maybe if we were to bring you back for a whole other show on thyroid embos, Here's like, you know, you're, you're, you're laying the groundwork <laughs> for part two thyroid yeah, intervention. Yeah, we, we should definitely do a part two thyroid intervention. Thyroid embo is like the new frontier. Ablation again was FDA approved in the States in 2018. So that's certainly taken off and we've grown dramatically in the last four or five years with regard to that. But I think the new frontier is goiters and very large nodules above 30 cc's. We see that all the time. If you read CT chest, you see these big goiters, they're all the time. And guess what? It's a pain in the butt for surgeons, right? I mean, it's they got to crack the chest to get it out. It's not like a simple thing. And those are the cases I'm getting referred to by my endocrine surgeons, whom again, are all amazing. But this is a great option for these patients. We're doing embolization for liver, fibroids, kidneys, you know, AMLs, all that stuff, you know, prostate, prostate, yeah. exactly. And uh, why not thyroid? And uh, interestingly enough, there was a couple papers 20 years ago out of China. They were doing thyroid embo specifically for Graves' disease, so people that were symptomatic hyperthyroidism. And what they did a report was they saw like 60 to 80 percent shrinkage of these goyers. It was a side effect, if you will. Uh, but they got them all U thyroid. And so three years later, there was a paper at JVIR out of Turkey where they did a retrospective study on about 50 or 60 patients. I forget. Uh, showing that they could get robust two-year, their follow-up I think was about two years, 80% shrinkage of these goiters or very large nodules. And so similar to any embolization procedure, you're going to get arterial access, you're going to go up and over the arch, and then you're going to do two or three of the thyroid arteries. You know, usually if it's a big goiter, you're going to do the superior thyroid and the inferior thyroid on one side and the inferior thyroid on the other side. And if it's just a big nodule, just do the superior inferior thyroid on that ipsilateral side. And you're just doing three to 500 micron beads. Uh, you obviously want to make sure there's no collaterals to the verts or the, the spinal cord, but patients have a great result. I mean, we see shrinkage like 60, 70% within two weeks. Wow. And it's very, very well tolerated. They can have some post embo syndrome as we see with other things, but I think that that is an exciting thing. And there's a great need because all these patients otherwise would have, if you think about it, have total thyroidectomies and they'd be on thyroid hormone for the rest of their life but I can shrink it for up to 80%, right? And they'll never need to replace their thyroid. Their thyroid hormones are normal. And if they ha actually are hyperthyroid, they have Graves' disease, I can get them off of their anti-thyroid meds. So I think this is the new frontier. I think that IRs play a great role here and I'm hoping that it'll grow. And uh, UCLA, we're, we're hoping to do a prospective trial with industry. We're already in the protocols of it. So We'll see how that shakes out. But I, again, I, I think it's a great growth area within the thyroid and ventral RAM. Very cool. On the scale of like zero to 10, like zero being a FNA or a bone marrow biopsy, 10 being like the portal vein recan um, <laughs> with everything is thrombosed for the SMV to the splenic on the difficulty scale. How, how tough is the thyroid embo? Oh, I mean, I the first 
two I did took long. And the real reason why is because I was doing spins. I, I had 3D spins. I was worried about like <laughs> yeah, 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 spinal yeah, yeah, cord yeah, yeah. stuff. I think the last one I did was probably, I don't know, hour, hour and a half. It's very straightforward. The the arteries are hypertrophy. They're big, just like the urinary artery and fibroids. So I, I probably on a scale of 10, I put it at a six or seven. I think that if you have a younger, healthier, younger, healthier, meaning like 50 to 70 year old, it's easy. You just get a vert catheter up. A little older patient that's torturous, you need to use a SIM-1 to to get up there, you know, like a stroke case. But I would say it's maybe 7 out of 10. You just get in there. They're usually hypertrophied. Your catheter is going to fly right in. And then uh, if you get distal enough, you don't have to worry about the beads going somewhere they shouldn't go. And it's pretty straightforward. Very cool. All right. So back to uh, the original topic, thyroid ablations, and I'm wrapping it up. If you have any resources or helpful articles that, that you thought of, one, you can say them here on the podcast. That would be fine. Or if you think of any, you can also send them to me offline. We can upload them to the show notes. But anything like a good paper that is helpful for people starting out the procedure or just getting started? Yeah. So I think that probably the most important paper that one should read is the Korean Journal of Radiology, KJR Thyroid Guidelines. I believe that they were published in 2017. And it literally will walk you through it step by step. It, it tells you how many biopsies you need beforehand. It comments on Bethesda criteria for molecular markers. It talks about whether you need TSH follow-up, ultrasound follow-up. And you can probably go through the references to see the moving shot technique and the transismic approach. So I think that that article by far is important to at least just review the literature. I think many of us, you know, We've been doing IR for forever. I mean, who knows what TSH or T4, or T3 or T4 is, you know, I mean, we just don't remember that stuff, but this will sort of spell it out for you. And if you can speak that language with your endocrinologists and the endocrine surgeons, they'll respect you more and send you those cases. So you're, you know, you're not just a, a monkey with a pro, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. L- line monkey, right? Exactly. Okay. So, so I think that that paper is by far the best article to start uh, from a resource standpoint. And anybody that's listening to this can obviously email me and I'm happy to answer any questions or show them slides, et cetera. Gary, dangerous proposition to put out there. We have a lot of audience members. You could get flooded. You could get flooded <laughs> with emails. We're, we're, we're quite popular at this point, so who knows? All right, Gary, any, any stone left unturned? Final thoughts? Like, did I not bring up anything or did we round up this topic pretty well? No, I think that we we went through it pretty well. There's obviously a few nuances, but people can reach out to me. I think it's important and very, very important for us to grow in this area and take it because there's going to be a lot of players that are interested in it. And being so skilled at ultrasound puts us at a significant advantage and getting good patient outcomes with minimal complications. So I would just encourage all the listeners on the podcast to, you know, really just get your your hands wet with this procedure and offer this amazing, amazing thing for, for our patients and have great outcomes. I mean, if it were me or my mom, I would rather to have a thyroid ablation than a hemithyroidectomy, hands down. So uh, this is something we should always be offering our patients. It should be standard of care. So, you know, good luck to all those people listening in. Excellent. Really appreciate that. And maybe, I mean, we have you on record saying potential part two for thyroid embos. Let's do it. And if we can get you back. Okay. All right. All right. I like it. All right. To our audience, thank you for listening. If you guys enjoyed the podcast, but want more, please check out the show notes on this episode. I think the references are going to be pretty quick. We got the one article, but if we mention anything else, those show notes can be found at www.backtable.com. Very easy to remember. And a special thank you to the med students who helped us get those together. We appreciate that. For others interested in supporting the show, like, subscribe, and share this podcast on social media, or just go old school and tell somebody about it. Old-fashioned word of mouth is very, very helpful as we continue to build this community. That wraps things up. We'll see you next time on the Backtable Podcast. Gary, thanks for coming on. All right, cheers. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer, design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Ann Dang 
Manisha Naganathanahali, and Manbir Singh Sabli. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening.